Okay, we are on the clap. Um, welcome everyone. Maybe if some folks from like speakers, Arini, maybe co-organizers, if you wanna drop the link to the pad in the chat as people trickle in, but I'll get us started with some introductions. So welcome, you're hearing me on Infinite Loop here. My name is Anne Lee Steele. I'm the community manager for the Turing Way. Um, I'm kicking off this session to tell you a little bit more about the project before I'll pass the mic to Irini Zompa, my colleague and a core member of the team who will take it away for this very exciting and very topical first fireside chat of 2023. Um, a couple of words about the Turing Way as a project. We're an open source, open collaboration and community developed handbook for data science. Um, and our goal is to make reproducible, ethical, collaborative data science too easy not to do, um, and to make it accessible and comprehensible for everyone, no matter where you are and no matter what background you come from. And so while it's me speaking to you today to introduce the project, I'm representing a much wider team of folks that includes Irini, that includes many folks here, um, that are representing a wider community of international researchers, um, experts of all kinds who've created the shared resource. And they themselves, along with all of us, bring um, shared perspectives from their fields, their countries, their backgrounds, and their lived experiences, similar to the speakers that we have together with us today. Um, and this Fireside Chat series was started in an effort to create a shared space um, within the open ecosystem to gather, exchange concerns, ideas, explore challenges, and share different perspectives that work in their context um, to build allyship, to understand each other's work and perspectives just a little bit better. Um, but with that being said, I'll stop here and pass the mic on to Irini to introduce herself and the topic for today's Fireside Chat, the first one of 2023. Awesome, thank you so much, Anne. Um, so yeah, welcome everyone to uh, this month's uh, Fireside Chat, uh, hosted by the Turing Way, as Anne just explained, uh, but also co-hosted and co-developed with the Open Life Science Fellows, who will introduce themselves shortly. Uh, my name is Irini Zrumpa, uh, like Anne, I'm a community manager, I work at the Allen Turing Institute, where I work on a project that uses AI to study multiple long-term health conditions. Uh, my role within this project is to build a community of early career researchers and to enable reproducible collaborative research. The topic of this month's fireside chat is reflect, unlearn, reframe, community care in times of digital burnout. And this is something that is really close to my heart. Um, I work now with a lot of early career, early, early career researchers, uh, but I was myself and arguably I still am an early career researcher uh, not so long ago. Uh, I finished my PhD in 2020 um, and, you know, at the time I felt and still do that early career researchers face so much pressure, you know, competition within academia is fierce. And even if you don't want to stay in academic research, it's just so difficult to figure out uh, what there is out there for you. Um, so for example, I realized during my PhD that, you know, post PhD, I wanted to be involved in open research and help shape an academic culture that's more open and more collaborative but I didn't really know how to do that. So I got involved in so many things, uh, you know, trying to figure that out. And don't get me wrong, I, I loved it, <laughs> but it also contributed to me burning out. So, you know, with the move right now, so many things having moved online, which of course in many ways is wonderful and allows us to have meetings such as this one, um, it can also be so much easier to be overwhelmed. So those are kind of like my thoughts, my initial thoughts on this, uh, but I'm delighted to co-host this conversation with Patricia Herterich, uh, who is a fellow at Open Life Science, who will introduce herself and the OLS fellowship program in a moment. Um, we're also joined by Maya Sundukova, Chris Harkering, and Agnes Kiraga, who will introduce themselves as well. Uh, but just, just a few housekeeping things uh, first. Uh, please note that we have a shared etherpad, which you have seen the link uh, being posted in the chat many times by now. Uh, so we use that to facilitate uh, written note taking and to invite ideas from you uh, who have joined to listen in today. So please feel free to add questions and notes into the pad or to the chat, uh, whichever you prefer, we, we will find them, don't worry. 
Uh, we also have a code of conduct that applies to this event. Uh, it is linked uh, in the etherpad that um, we have shared. So we have this code of conduct to ensure accessibility and respectful collaboration with everyone. So for any concerns uh, or reporting of an incident that makes you feel uncomfortable at this call, um, or if you have any further ideas uh, to improve the accessibility of our events, please email the Turingway at gmail.com, or you can directly reach out to Anne or uh, Malvika Sharan, who is the co-lead of the Turingway. You can email them to their private email, uh, and you can see that information again on the etherpad. Uh, just as a reminder that we will hold this Zoom room that we're in uh, open for an additional 15 minutes at the end of the call, just to have an unrecorded open discussion. Um, this is completely optional, uh, but it is when we are able to turn off, uh, you know, the recording sometimes that we're able to ask questions of each other and ourselves um, in a slightly less formal way uh, than this one. And it's always a really cool, interesting conversation. So I do invite you to stay if you have the time and, you know, uh, the space. So with that, I'm really delighted to hand it over to Patricia to kick off today's session. Um, so Patricia, over to you. Thank you, Irini, and thank you, Anne, for um, giving us this fireside chat space uh, to have this conversation. My name is Patricia Hatterich. I am an OLS resident fellow. Um, for those of you who don't uh, know what open life science is, um, open life science is kind of is an organization that like focuses on capacity building um, uh, around uh, open open science, open research, but also um, yeah leadership skills. Um, core part uh, of uh, what we do is hosting a 16 week long mentoring program where um, people can come with the projects, learn about open science and um, learn practical leadership skills along the way. Um, the resident fellows are kind of a new experimental thing. Um, uh, I was uh, kindly invited to be part of the first cohort and I started this in, in October last year um, kind of uh, yeah having the opportunity to support the the program the team but also um, explore topics that uh, are of personal interest and um, yeah to develop um, myself and the community further um, I joined Open Life Science after deciding to um, quit my job at a university here in the UK. Um, and that was like, a, you know, I just didn't thrive any longer. I probably think I was burned out by the uh, end, at least a lot of the, the symptoms for, for burned out um, uh, felt very familiar. Um, and I was in the very privileged position that I could just decide to stop working in that job, take a break, reflect on what I wanted to do. Um, and um, yeah, I was lucky enough to be invited to work with uh, o OLS, but also, um, yeah, I set myself up as a, a self-employed consultant. Um, I've worked with the, the Touring Way. I've worked with OLS and they're all wonderful, wonderful communities um, that uh, have the topic of well-being and self-care close to their hearts. But I also see people um, struggling. I know community management is a really hard role because you want to, um, you know, do right by everyone in your community. Uh, and sometimes it is uh, difficult to forget uh, your, yourself and take time for yourself uh, when you're super busy doing that. Um, so this fireside chat is kind of, um, yeah, a, a selfish project of having a conversation with really interesting people, um, uh, trying to understand, you know, how, how we can be better in like uh, taking care of ourselves um, and having that in energy to, to support our communities. Um, a lot of times, like the recommendations you get are like on like a personal level, 
Um, but I think there's like, you know, some structural um, things in, in place in the wider organizations and the small teams where we potentially, um, yeah, can, can support each other better. So this is really like um, a learning opportunity um, for myself in conversation with um, all the other wonderful people on this call. And hopefully uh, we also uh, get input from you. The etherpad is there and we have the follow-up discussion um, once the recording is over. So um, this is why we are here. Um, Irini said like um, we kind of narrowed it down to this wonderful tagline uh, of reflect, uh, unlearn and reframe. And uh, with that, I'd like to um, ask uh, our fellow speakers uh, on this um, fireside chat panel to introduce themselves, um, reflect on, on the topic and why um, they were like interested in joining this panel and um, their, their journey so far with as much detail as your um, comfortable sharing with this um, audience here. And um, the first person I'd like to ask to introduce yourself is my fellow resident fellow at Open Life Science, um, Maya. Maya, please. Tell the wonderful people on this call who you are. Thank you, wonderful fellow Patricia, um, for the great uh, introduction and to Open Life Science and your journey. And thanks to the organizers for invitation to co-develop this. Extremely thrilled to be here. Um, I'm connecting from Spain. Uh, I'm Maya, pronounce she, her. Um, I self-identify with a researcher because I've been uh, working as neurobiologist for more than a decade, spending um, days and days in dark, um, isolated environments because I was working with electrophysiology and fluorescent microscopy. Um, however, um, since the pandemics, I left the um, academia, uh, the wet lab, um, not really voluntarily, um, and it gave me the space and time to, yeah, to to reflect, to stop, to recreate, um, to search for other identities. And I also like to mention I had the privilege to be able to um, afford myself even uh, going to study again. Um, because what I realized I, I could offer to others is to help other researchers, especially early career researchers, as Irini mentioned, um, uh, not to fall, uh, but to, to sustain them in transitioning in difficult moments as, as a coach and mentor. And now I'm also, um, as Patricia mentioned, a resident fellow at the Open Life Science. It's indeed a wonderful community. Uh, which allows to um, to embody different ways of of, um, of working with people or developing research practices. And um, I started later than Patricia, and um, my projects are about communication and outreach um, because I really like kind of stories and storytelling. And the other part is related to um, mental well-being at the individual and collective level. Um, I'm also studying uh, the Master of Narrative Therapy and Community Work here in Spain, which is a um, very particular approach to counseling and uh, social work um, that develops also collective practices that allow to, um, to find ways to work with uh, individual hardship or suffering, but in a way that it it creates a social action or it, it becomes useful to the whole community. Um, I'm really um, grateful to, to the availability of having digital environments because as, um, as I traveled a lot because of my career, I had each time to start from scratch to build the social network and the social capital. So 
um, it's a really an amazing opportunity to to study to to be able to take a master um, in your 30s uh, from home but of course words of overwhelm resonate a lot so I'm looking forward to to talk and I'd love to pass the microphone to Chris yeah thanks Maya uh, so hey everyone I'm Chris Hackrink I'm calling in from Berlin today uh, this is where I'm based I'm uh, Dutch originally, but I moved here after I finished my PhD contract. I uh, I had to take care of myself in that way. So very similar. Um, I had to take a break and I packed up my bag and literally just hopped on a train, moved to Berlin uh, on a bit of an adventure uh, to sort of recover from that a bit. And only at the start of this year did I really start saying that I was a recovered academic and no longer recovering. So I think that, uh, you know, we, 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 Probably many people I've spoken to have said that they've introduced themselves that way as well for a while. Uh, so it leaves scars in, in a way, but that also tells a story. And I really like that about this uh, fireside chat is also how do we, instead of just telling the story, make something more out of it. And in that sense, um, so I... I I'm no longer in academia. I now run a, a business where we create uh, open access publishing platforms, but also communities around sharing the research process uh, more continuously. And in that, my sort of my northern star is the whole time, uh, how can we do things radically different? And what does that mean? And I think in terms of community care, we sometimes, or at least for, for myself, I I had to learn and I had to reflect on the fact that community care isn't obvious. Uh, all these toxic situations that uh, probably every a lot of people have experiences with themselves, those are a result of the lack of community care. And uh, one of the reflections that really mattered for me was also the lack of care towards those who don't have power in those situations. So if you have less power, like early career researchers, they need much more care than uh, people who have more power. And I think from my own experiences, sort of being in those situations and then moving into more also trying to construct and to manage a community and to take care of a community, one of the things that I've noticed is that it amplified all the issues that I was still dealing with on a personal level. So it's like a magnifying glass on uh, what I still needed to go through. And one of the things that I wanted to share here today was also a question that really helped me uh, is asking, when I ask myself, what's the fantasy I tell myself around relations that I have uh, with, with other people? And uh, it was while I was reading a book on, you know, uh, parental attachment and how that affects your, your how you present yourself in relations. And one of the things that I articulated for myself through some reflection was also that I very much put myself aside and focus on taking care of others' needs. And that as a result of that, that other people will also take care of my needs. And it's one of those, uh, one of those things that once I articulated it and actually wrote it down, I realized that sounds very nice, uh, but by not actually sharing my own needs in that community, uh, I, I, it led me to sort of uh, go by, uh, leave myself by the wayside. And so, you know, I don't want to talk way too long, but what does it really mean to be uh, caring for a community? And what does it mean to be generous in, in such a setting? And um, I think a lot of people who do community care if I generalize very briefly, I do tend to focus very much on other people. And I think there's a whole component of, you know, taking care of ourselves as well. And um, specifically with respect to burnout, there's also this uh, other insight, which really helped me was that I was still very much under this um, neoliberal capitalist space where, you know, if I can, I can get everything done. That was the underlying assumption. And only when I realized that that was, um, that was, that that was the underlying assumption, did I, did I really come to this conclusion that I can't, it's just not possible, no matter how good I manage my time, how effective I get, or, uh, how when how many windows I have open and could just follow along and save stuff in my YouTube watch later, and that was a really um, 
really helpful uh, aspect that came during my reflections that helped me. And with that, I'll shut up now and hand the microphone to the lovely Agnes. Uh, uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for inviting me to this first chair by chat. <laughs> and I'm excited to just listen in to the different uh, perspectives of what uh, academia goes through um, worldwide. So a bit about myself, I'm Agnes Chiraga. I am um, Ugandan, but working in Kenya, in Nairobi, with the African Population and Health Research Center. Uh, thanks to um, Novika through these connections that we happen to, to, to meet and get me here on this panel. And uh, so my training is really around statistics and I've spent a big part of my life working with um, clinicians and academia in Makere University prior to joining uh, um, Nairobi. And I currently head the data science unit and do a lot of work around data and trying to make um, use AI and data science to impact lives in Africa through research. And uh, yes, I've, I've been in research and academia for close to 15 years and it's there are those moments where you I can relate with what you're all talking. And uh, personally, uh, when you come from a, a statistical background or a math background and working in a setting that is more clinician driven, sometimes um, the resources are quite um, competitive. And I remember uh, my first attempt to write a grant and I got these reviews that say, well, you are a statistician, why are you even applying for clinical research? And yet you are at that space where as a young early career, you need to get to the next level, you are writing grant after grant, and sometimes it doesn't hit you like Chris says, like sometimes you're just going on, I can do this. You get these reviews, you're like, yes, I, 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 can, I can respond to them, maybe get going round two, round three, until it just hits you like, you know, at this, this, this has to stop. This really has to stop. It's really affecting you, affecting uh, the, the, the circles around you, your family, your, your peers. And um, so it's in those moments where you actually need a lot of community support, which at times is not that often available. And you have to seek within your institution or within your circle to get um, to get to get help. And, and I remember after rounds of quite lots of disappointment, being a support staff, uh, writing so many papers, sometimes you have to look through and, and, and see what is in it, uh, wh where is this going. And I, one of the things I did was to start up uh, just a tea with fellow women who are going through that, that kind of burnout. Uh, how do you juggle so many things? You're trying to move your career. You're trying to write papers, trying to write a grant. You're competing with so many others. And at the same time, um, learning uh, to cope as with so many other competing interests. So I, it's one of the things that um, kept, kept me going. And we have this circle of women uh, uh, where we just kind of sit, <laughs> similar to a fire chat, but over tea anyway, not fire. And, and, just, <laughs> and just say, wait, I had this terrible review. How are you going through it? And sometimes the privilege of stepping out is not there or just sitting back and say, all right, let me chill and, and I'll wait for the next resources. So you, you kind of have to keep going, but at the same time, trying to be very mindful of your own mental health and, 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 and being and, and survival. So it's um, just listening. It has been very, it's good to relate and, and see that it's, it cuts across different environments. So I'm really keen uh, to the next discussion. Thank you. What a wonderful panel. Um, it's like, this is, yeah, I'm really, really happy and lucky to um, be, be in discussion with all, all of you. Um, I think we, we heard already a little bit from Chris and Agnes about some strategies um, and, you know, um, uh, like reading a lot of things and suddenly you realize or you have like conversations uh, um, with like a, a 
safe group of people that you've built yourself up that are your support uh, network but um like going on to the point of un unlearning is there uh you know do you have like um any strategies to share or any like moments where you've identified behavior in the the team that you were in or the organization something where you realized this is not helping me thrive um and how you like consciously um tried to to step away to the, um from that how you unlearn maybe you still like discover yourself every once in a while like stepping into uh into situations um and actually having to you know uh, take a moment and um notice like what am i doing here i'm just replicating what i've seen but this is not necessarily what i want to be um so yeah is for on a personal level but also maybe like in your team in your community so, um any any tips that you can um give people on this call how to start unlearning and uh, i think i'll put this to chris first because you've already started giving hints to in in this direction so if you have more uh, of that to kick us off please please do yeah thanks patricia so one of the things that for me really became obvious only when is sort of this the structures started shifting that there were certain lessons that i could only start unlearning as a result of that was also that, for example, in my research environment, there was very much this idea of teamwork is just passing the ball, right? You pass the ball to somebody, they work on something, they pass the ball back to you, and that's it. And I think that one of the things that helped me um, when I shifted the structure, when I really started working in either a team or in a community where these responsibilities are much more intertwined, and it's not about passing the ball, but about really playing as a team. And if one person doesn't you know, run to the other end of the field, I'm not at all a sports person. So uh, this is very weird for me to talk in sports analogies, but if somebody runs to the, uh, doesn't run to the other end of the field as the whole team does, then that's going to create issues. And so one of the things for me is really also unlearning is was for me very helpful through really changing those structures that I didn't even realize it as to how big a degree they were impacting me. And sometimes, you know, even years later, I'll be unpacking situations or I'll be in situations where I think, oh, wow. I didn't realize that this could be done so differently and vice versa. If I see people in certain structures, how, how that can predict or precipitate more large problems for them on a, uh, on a, on a mental health level, or simply on, you know, trying to make those changes and to, to bring community along. So I think that's one aspect. Uh, and I had another aspect when I started talking. Oh yeah, this this one. Um, so I think that in the unlearning, one of the aspects I also really that's really helped me is to think about uh, sort of a flywheel effect where you build up momentum for yourself. So when you have z when you go from zero uh, and you have no momentum, it looks like everything is going to be incredibly hard. And but you need to give yourself space to to start building that momentum. And I think that uh, in that unlearning process, you might know where you want to be in the future, uh, but you don't really know how to get there. And that's OK. So if you know that there is one practical thing that would help you even even an inch in that direction, then do that thing. And that can help you unlearn. It can help you start gaining that momentum to to unlearn more things and to start setting those boundaries more more thoroughly. Uh, so that's more on an individual level uh, where you say, okay, you know, the choices that you make will help you grow to make better choices that will help you unlearn even more. Uh, so those are two things, both one on the structural level, really change your environment to understand what it is that you need to or could unlearn. And it can also help learn you, teach you what is good about the other environment. 
and then on the individual level really don't don't put that pressure to go all all the way immediately but what are, what is like even a tiny tiny decision you can make to help you gain momentum and unlearning some behaviors wonderful um don't know who else from the panel would uh, like to go next maya do you have any insights from maybe the masters you're doing at the moment or any anything else mm. well uh, it's nice that you ask about the masters because the the dogma or dogma the motto of the narrative therapy and community work is problem is a problem person is a person so for me it was really important to separate from, from my own uh, first um, recognize that it's not my fault that I was not uh, I don't know <laughs> competitive enough in the academia or like fitting the expectations of, of the supervisors and the, the but it's it's kind of not about me it's about the context about this concrete um, community or collective because we all know that in some communities the same person thrive and is seen and is nurtured and admired and the same person in other communities uh, can be bullied or um, somehow seen in a different way um, and for me it was really important to unlearn to not to think that I'm also the expert because I have a PhD I have a master no and as many scientists, we really, we have, we are seen in the societies as experts in our very specialized knowledge, no? But sometimes we think we know for everyone how to live better. And um, I think if you are a leader of a team, it's important not to uh, take it for granted that you know what is good for the members. And therefore it, it is nice maybe to unlearn, like to try to, take a position that is not in the center, but put the other person in the center of attention and realize that you have influence on that person by your actions. So, um, yeah, and also kind of, yeah, deconstruct what is implicit. Again, coming back to communities, I think what was for me useful to observe and then learn is that taking for granted things uh, just because things were always like this in this community and then someone international comes or everyone in the group is without kids and this person has a kid and you start to re rearrange all the like worldview how you you think about how you structure i don't know practices in the team i don't know how you set up lab meetings uh, do you set up meetings at five <laughs> or you maybe do it during the day um I think it's really important to have diverse teams um, and try to make all voices be heard. Yeah. Thank you for highlighting that it's never the individual that fails, but that it is a, a system that fails the individual. I think that is like one of the very key messages um, here. And uh, it's like, if we look at these big um, academic institutions, quite often, um, you know, when someone's struggling, the solution is to send them on a mindfulness course or something. Um, and that's definitely uh, not helpful and what we need. Um, Agnes, I'm wondering if any of this resonates or if in, in the communities and the small groups that you've created, um, talking about um, burnout or issues, if you um, have have learned anything from uh, from those conversations that you'd like to sh share. I think uh, one of the things that I've learned, I, I think coming from a research, like it's, it's it's okay sometimes to pause and 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 reflect and. I, because sometimes it's just endless and um, you're chasing so many things and you, and sometimes you actually achieve what you're chasing, but at the moment you achieve it, you just start the roller coaster again. 
and it's like an endless process. So I've, I've learned to, to pause and if, if I don't get what I don't need to get at times, it's, it's, it's fine sometimes in the research, in the research environment, because um, it, otherwise it, you just keep going and it actually affects a lot of your, of your mental health. But one of the things I've also learned when you're working as a team is to learn to delegate uh, and also asking uh, many of the members, sometimes you're just in it by yourself and just to relieve, uh, relieve some of the group activities and delegate, even when you have um, members who you think might be going through um, certain aspects that um, you might or might not be able to control, but just learning to, to let go of certain things for your good and for the good of the team and Dedication, I think for me, is something I've learned that I didn't have a lot. I tended to do so many things by myself. And, but I think I'm, I'm definitely learning through that. I'm also moving from a mind shift of uh, being a victim uh, to being a creator every time you are in a situation. So I, I just try to, okay, I'm going through this today. How am I going to tackle this? Do I have my victim hat on or am I going to? come on with a creator solution. So in every situation, um, that way you inadvertently are, are kind of avoiding that that extreme burnout at times. So it's um it's a process, but I think I've learned a lot to delegate and to think of a solution every time I'm, or at least what I can do within my means or within the institution level to come up with a, something to to support um, the, myself and my teammates. Okay. Amazing. You just like in my my head while you were talking, a lot of like little bells were were going off saying, yeah, yes, yes. I'm like um uh also slightly uh, uh a control freak sometimes and like you know very bad at delegating. And then if if I hit issues in, in the system where I couldn't control things any longer, that's where like I you know things started to fall down. And um I I love your your focus on on the agency that you have in in creating solutions. Um, this is uh, um, yeah, it's an amazing um, way to reframe things. I don't want to jump onto the next topic again um, already. Um, Irini, do you have anything to? Uh, to uh, um, the the aspect of unlearning from your experience, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna say anything profound, really, but like for me, what was well, unfortunately for me, what started the process of unlearning was burning out. So don't do what I did. Um, but you know, it did kind of force me to stop and think about you know like what is actually important to me and like a lot of people you go into research for you know various reasons but um I don't know I think it's maybe a little bit of a millennial capitalist thing to be really attached to your work right and like define your self-worth um by the work that you do. And that's just really harmful. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah. So for me, stopping, being forced to stop really, I guess, and thinking about, you know, what, what do I need? And, you know, at first just to be able to go back and finish the PhD and actually like be done with this whole thing. Um, but, you know, like um, it made me, think of myself first rather than putting my work first uh and that was really difficult uh at first and you know it was like every time that i would catch myself you know relaxing and doing a little a little more stuff for like fun you know not working as much uh, I felt guilty, right? I think that's a really common thing that academics say, you know, that you you go on holiday uh, and you stress about all the work that you're not doing, right? Um, and that's kind of the thing that I had to unlearn, that, you know, like taking care of myself is 
more important than doing the work and you know there's like a utilitarian way to phrase this as well if that's what you need right to get you to that place of if you don't take care of yourself first you can't do the work uh and hopefully that's like a gateway drug to no just take care of yourself that's like that's a good goal in and of itself um but yeah that's kind of like my my thinking around that <laughs> Do you want to share something about your unlearning, Patricia? I think it was similar to, um, like, to what Chris said, like, just, you know, reading a lot and then looking at the situations you were in and realizing this is actually just the thing that I read about. And like, you know, you, you think, you think, um, you know, think you don't have burnout. You, you don't think like you're in an obvious toxic environment. Um, and then you, you, you chat to people and uh, suddenly like, you know, um, things go off and you're like, okay, I'll give this one more, one more go at changing the system. Um, but like a lot of it was like if people learning that you can't change other people you can only change how you deal with the situations and once I realized that as like it was a bit like doesn't necessarily matter what I'll do there I'll I'll do here it you know they they don't want certain change to happen um so i need to make that change elsewhere um so that that was like a, a, a big felt like a biggish step at that time but in in um it's just going um back to really like um what what agnes said just realizing you can see yourself as the as the victim in that one place or you can say like I am the creator of my career my what what I want to be and you just you know um go elsewhere and create and if um, those people in that one place didn't want to to have me the way I was um and with the structures they have set up um I think it's a, a lot of it is like learning to trust your skills and that there will be someone who appreciates them. I had like quite a, you know, when I when I made that big step, it was a bit like, oh my God, will I ever be employable again? And yes, yes, you are. We you all like have wonderful skills and there will be someone who um uh, uh, appreciates them and um and we'll work with you and we'll be very, very happy and lucky to work with you. Um, I think this is the person who's working with you way of saying, yes, Patricia, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> uh, that is beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and yeah, as you said, actually, Agnes did set us up perfectly for the reframing question of, you know, how do we, um, take all of these things that hopefully we can unlearn, how can we reframe them ourselves or, you know, in a larger way within our teams uh, or within our fields um, to take this forward? Um, so yeah, Agnes, do you want to reflect a little bit about how we reframe um, to take care of ourselves and of others in our communities? Well, uh, I guess be selfish in a way, <laughs> put yourself first. I, I think um, in the whole era of, you know, the capitalist digital environment, it's just endless. So uh, if I look at how I set up my days in a week, uh, I intentionally block out some hours like Thursday and I just purpose, you know, I, I, I need some time for myself even during the week, despite whatever is happening because it's endless so i think uh put it so fast and then um and 
I think or is really like I'll just go back, try and think through not as a victim. I just keep holding on to that. And then if there's something that you can wave yourself around and create a solution in whatever you are that benefits you first. And then um yeah, not to be very selfish, but I think we, we need to put ourselves first in every in many situations because um uh you if you don't take care of yourself first then it's hard for actually whatever help you need uh to 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 come through so i as as as, as i think through how i reframe all this and and i always um imagine um situations i mean if if you're not there something still go on so i i you just always have to think through that and and yeah and be there and have yourself with your mindset and your and the inner strength that you have literally yeah in, in a nutshell yeah so I, I think I'll stop there for now yeah no thank you I mean I think yeah it can be counterintuitive right like be selfish <laughs> to take care of others but I mean to an extent uh you know that that is just what needs to happen your responsibility is to you know so. keeping yourself <laughs> alive and you know whatever your version of healthy is um and to your point of you know like sometimes i just need a break in the week i'm like yes four days week let's let's make it happen i love Um, that (laughs) um yeah do any of you uh have any thoughts about what Agnes said or would you like to share your perspectives uh I see Chris moving around I think you have something to say <laughs> yeah yeah good eye uh so I I very much agree with Agnes and I think that um uh you know I, the only thing I would maybe slightly disagree on is calling it selfish because uh in that sense you know, I've started reframing it less as a selfish act and more as a reciprocal act. Like I, if I give a lot to the community, then there's also a, from a reciprocity standpoint, from a balance sort of, it's also then it requires me to then also give that to myself, but it also allows me to reframe some of these issues with respect to um, just like if I've been giving a lot to the, to a community or to a, uh, an organization or to an initiative or whatever, then at some point there's also a certain amount of uh, reciprocity that should come uh, back in my direction. And in that sense, thinking about the purpose that you have or the goals that you have uh, is very helpful in negotiating whether that reciprocity can exist. And sometimes that means saying, you know, it's not there and that's fine. Sometimes, uh, you know, that can be in personal relations with friends, but that can also be in professional relations. And uh, I think that in the chat, somebody earlier shared, you know, in toxic situations, you can't easily extricate yourself from that. So it's not always an option to do this, but it has definitely helped me to reframe my thinking in it and to be less um, uh, self self detrimental, like uh, to, to put myself down. Because, uh, yeah, that's that's one of the things that that's been incredibly helpful. And also in terms of whether stuff is proportional, uh, sometimes people respond very disproportionately to very small things, which to me is also a very helpful way to reframe uh, to reframe that. And uh, very practically, I think this four week, four day work week is something I can only attest to when I founded Liberate Science. I said, you know, we'll do four four day work weeks. Uh, I wasn't as as consistent with it for myself, but uh, in November or October last year, I said, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to try and be better at it for myself because, you know, I run the business. So why should, before I always thought I shouldn't, I have more responsibilities, but then I went like, no, I grant myself this. And um, I've, I've created uh, what I call creative Fridays. So, of course, I'm doing this on Friday, so I'm not setting the best example. But sometimes, you know, there are things that that give a lot as well. Um, so, yeah, if if that is even an option, like I understand it's not in a lot of places. Uh, that's That's been incredible because I can, you know, be a bit sad or, or feel some some tension in myself on, on the Thursday. And then really that Friday helps just so much. Uh, 
and um, yeah, so I wanted to uh, strengthen that point. And if any anybody needs resources to you know uh, to argue for that in their workplace, then I'm happy to provide those as well. That sounds amazing. Like I I mentioned the four day week because there was I think like a study not so long ago that found that in the UK, like most of the places that implemented it. Uh, we're actually sticking with it, like after the pilot phase. Um, so yes, let's make it happen. Also, unions, uh, join a union, that that would help. Um, but I also wanted to point out, I loved your phrasing of, you know, reciprocity of, you know, like, okay, I am giving this job or this person, you know, this much. Uh, and I thought you were going to say, I expect to receive something similar from them. Um, but also you mentioned, but this is also what I owe myself, right? If this is what I give others, I should do the same for myself as well. And that's something I hadn't thought about in that way before. And that's that's really interesting. Yeah, I really I really like that. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, so Maya, I'd like to to come to you. Uh, what what would you like to share with us about unlearn uh, reframing? <laughs> Sorry, reframing. <laughs> Well, um, reframing, yeah, um, I, I resonate to all of the things you mentioned before. Um, the, I think we all have ethical responsibility of taking self-care, care of ourselves, making sure that we, like my coach, my first coach was teacher saying like, coach is a cup. And we are there for the person. And so think first, you have to be strong to hold that space. And I think it's applicable to everyone who has certain, who is not a baby anymore, no? Because we always take care of someone. Um, and it's really important to take care of the cup. And then going with the metaphor, if it breaks, then you go with the kintsugi art and you mend the pieces into a new uh, piece of art and it's eternal. And however, I think what came to my mind uh, about reframing experiences is um, when we talk to someone, we somehow about something problematic, we tend to focus on the problem. Kind of, it's like, uh, I don't know if you now, um, look very attentively to your room where you are and remember all brown things in the room. Just, you know, 10 seconds to remember them. Now, close your eyes and tell me um, which things were blue. I don't know. Um, it seems some of you may have some <laughs> challenge in remembering that. So I think when we witness our friends, when they tell us stories about things that are important for them that are their problems, their difficulties, we should also try to remind them that there are blue things in their lives, that there are other things that we value in them that we know they have that skills, that expertise, but maybe it's not accessible to them in this moment. And this is not to say we're saying, no, you're not having a problem, it will pass. But just trying to kind of expand the, the picture uh, wider. Um, yeah. And another thing, when, when you mentioned reframe, I, I, I think uh, maybe about kind of policies and there are kind of high level legislations that have these frameworks and um, which kind of calls me, invites me to think like what we can do from this point of view, like is it our responsibility as a researcher, as a professional to think on a wider systemic scale, like uh, not only about what we do one-to-one -one or in a group, but um, think about other players, other stakeholders, um, you know, how the laws are created, how the policies are created, just 
think wider and of course it's very difficult to engage with policy and um, I'm, I didn't mention I'm a part of the REMO Research and Mental Health Observatory Network. It's a network of researchers, practitioners, very few policymakers. And we're trying, we're, I'm coordinating a, a project in which we will gather information on mental health of researchers in different countries. Then to go to policymakers in each of the countries and say, listen, this is the situation. <laughs> with mental health. Um, let's do something about it. Yeah, um, I wonder if Agnes um, can add this because of her position and maybe uh, experience in advising um, agencies. Um, uh, <laughs> I could attend. Uh, I think we, so we do have a project funded by Wellcome Trust where we are collecting researchers around, but I, doing work around mental health. And one of the things that keeps coming up beyond the researchers, uh, including the views of people who have lived with mental health, sometimes I feel like I should be part of the respondents <laughs> because literally many of us are you know, going through some kind of, uh, um, or at least a part of uh, depression or mental health. But um, yes, so on the policy side, in certain part where, because of the setting, sometimes it's um, mental health is not really taken as a priority. But I think what we're seeing is that the more you you meet with the policymakers, uh, take uh, make them aware of the burden. And I think COVID made it more pronounced uh, in parts of Africa where we are tempted now to see real vivid examples of uh, persons going through depression, mental health, and 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 suicide. So it, it's been a journey, uh, particularly in Africa, and there's a lot of ex, um, um, a lot of advocacy now to put mental health at the forefront, right from um, the young age to health facilities where people are going, uh, documenting some of these experiences, but most importantly, bringing out uh, persons now who have lived with mental health with or without their awareness. So it, it's something that uh, as researchers, particularly where I work, it's, it's becoming very pronounced. And in fact, every last Friday of um, at work, we do have a session of just uh, mental health, uh, talking about burnout, talking about um, depression, or it's just talking to staff because it's increasingly uh, an issue and, 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 but there's still lots of, of work to do, particularly at the policymakers, um, policymakers standpoint because there are so many other competing uh, issues and sometimes it's taken down their priority list but uh, it's something that we are making advocacy for so I'll be happy to tap into your expertise uh, I'll reach out to you as well thank you that's amazing thank you so much for sharing Agnes wow. every Friday that's <laughs> oh, every last Friday oh I wish it were every Friday <laughs> It's every <laughs> last Friday. Yeah, there's something today actually about uh, bipolar uh, at the workplace. Yeah. No, that that's fair enough. I was like, wow, <laughs> um, amazing. Thank you. And yeah, I mean, collecting the data, getting the information, it's the first step. It's definitely not the end goal, but without without having that information, without making it visible, um, you can't advocate um, for a change. Patricia, is there anything you would like to add? I would like to echo what a lot of people have said. Like, I really, really um, can advocate for not working full time. Or if you're working full time, don't, you know, don't make it like five long days, but like, make, like, try and find space and then figure out what you want to do with that time that recharges you um in my case um ha has turned out to ensure i make regular time for exercise so that's one of the um key bits that i've uh i've learned that i just need i feel so much happier uh in um uh, when I when I exercise and um, keep my butt, body moving, um, I think also one of these 
the things is like give you give yourself permission to just stop working when your brain is done with doing work um one of the the lessons i learned is like there's no point sitting at that desk and wasting hours here because whatever you're gonna create is um you know, it's not going to be of a, a quality that um, I, I'd be happy with. So to step away, come back um, with a recharged brain and um, try it then. And I think that's also one of the things that like came out in this um, um, four day work week trials is actually that like, you know, it doesn't affect quality. I think it's just people. Um, um, yeah have have more energy and uh in, in the four days that they're working um so it kind of like yeah sometimes we we feel like we need to see busy and that comes from this uh Irina you mentioned it initially like hustling mindset that um it feels like we were, we were told it was was um seen as very cool to be super busy and not have time for uh you know not have any free time um when i started my career and um i think we're now at uh, uh like in a position where people have learned that that basically just led to a generation of people being burned out and um i'm very very happy to see that um the generations coming after us have have learned their lessons and uh, uh, um, yeah, are putting themselves before their work. Um, but Irini, what are you doing to take care of yourself and uh, the community you're managing? Um, yeah, it's actually also exercise for me and in a way that I never expected. I now do team sports, which Last time I did team sports was when I was in primary school and I got made fun of, so I didn't do it ever again. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm in Cambridge in the UK, so roaming is the thing to do. And it's so nice because it takes you outside and the nature is pretty. And also, if you don't show up, eight other people don't get to do the thing they were supposed to do. So I like the accountability aspect of it. Um, like it makes me you know actually leave my house um i found that really helpful especially because now i work from home i mean honestly i work from home in this job less than i did in my previous one because in my previous job i worked in the netherlands but i lived in the uk so i went on campus exactly twice <laughs> um but you know before that um you know, I would have to be, you know, in the office from nine until four. And I would so much, you know, like stay there sometimes, not because I knew that I would manage to do anything, but because I was supposed to be in the office. So yeah, I totally echo what you said, Patricia, about, you know, giving yourself permission to just like stop and, you know, do something more productive with your time than just like make yourself feel bad uh, for not being able to think anymore. Um, so yeah, like all of the things that I'm going to say are, you know, like very personal, they're only going to apply to myself, you know, so, um, you know, take from this what you will, but experiment, basically see what makes you happy and try something new because sometimes, I don't know, like I had this where like, you know, when things get bad, like sometimes the things that used to give you joy, they no longer give you joy and they feel kind of different. So like trying new things sometimes that you didn't necessarily think um, would be for you, uh, you might actually really, really love. Also get a pet. Um, I got a pet a month ago and everyone should get a pet. My life is exactly 120% better for having a cat at home. <laughs> Um, so I think closing, we wanted to ask everyone, um, you know, like, what are you going to take away, uh, from this session that we had today? Um, and I'll just start just because I'm speaking. Um, and I just wanted to thank you all for kind of like the joy that you brought today, you know, like acknowledging how important that 
is, um, I think is something that we just don't talk about. Uh, I don't know. I feel like sometimes I feel naive when I'm like, I just want to be happy. I just want to do things that make me happy. Um, and I just really think that's really, really important. So yeah, thank you for kind of agreeing <laughs> with that. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I don't know. I'd like to pass the mic to whoever's taken the long, the longest not to speak, but I don't know who that is anymore. I think it might be Chris. <laughs> is that a weird order? Sorry. <laughs> I'm happy to, but I, I definitely do not know who then goes next. So I'll just pass it to somebody. Uh, so I, I take two things away. One, uh, apparently you can just share audio on Zoom now. So thank you, Anne. I need you to tell me how to do that because I did not know. And two, I think something else I take away from, from this is just simply simply holding, well, it's not simple, but creating space to have these conversations, literally what this is, is incredibly important uh, to, to do this kind of work. So also, if you're in a community where you're, you have the opportunity to create those spaces uh, as a participant or the manager, I think that's going to really help move that community forward. It's something that coincidentally we just started planning yesterday. So uh, that's something I take away. And I'll hand it over to Agnes. Um, yeah, my takeaway, I think uh, there's a lot. So I'm going to take back to my little group of my uh, the ladies that we meet with, probably try fire instead of tea. But um, uh, I think to really be vulnerable, not vulnerable, but to open up deeply, because sometimes uh, we only discussing something that's really work related, but kind of go beyond that and find uh, some inner, so open up more deeply and find uh, where we can support each other outside the work spot, outside the work discussions, really, because sometimes we're meeting and just talking about work or I failed to do this, I, I can't write this, I can't get this ready and I can't go for this conference or whatever, but just to move that to beyond work to other aspects of life that will help us um, achieve what we need to do. Then secondly, I think what I've seen is, what I've learned is that it's okay. Sometimes I see that my computer and I'm not achieving anything, I'm not writing, I'm tired, but I'm not going to rest either. <laughs> so I think moving forward, I just need to, um, yeah, let go and it, it's it's okay. You don't have to feel guilty when you just shut down your laptop and take a walk and come back in a better position to continue. So it's a very good lesson up and I enjoyed the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. Uh, Maya? Oh, um, I'm just very warm, feeling warm, feeling warm and relaxed now after this one hour of fireside chat which really felt like this in the beginning i was a bit scared maybe um and feeling vulnerable but now actually it feels uh, different and i just want to have more opportunities like that and i really value all the different perspectives that you shared from all these backgrounds in terms of internationality and work-wise and also a lot of comments that I'm really willing to read. Uh, it's all kind of it's very warm and makes me feel fuller and I realize that it's well kind of in relations that in these conversations we all kind of created a relation between us because we shared something, we reacted or by nodding or by commenting and this is precious, this interconnectedness. I'll pass to Patricia. Thank you, Maya. Um, I was about to say like, I feel joy and energy, but then I thought like actually go to a place where you don't often go. So what I, I will say is like at the moment I feel pride uh, and I don't like feel proud of myself very often, but I feel like um, it just, you know, hearing all the the wonderful um aspects from you see i uh, like just i have one eye on the chat and there's just so much good stuff in there that i'm i can't wait to to um dig in and um i'm giving myself permission to say 
I'm proud that we have managed to create um, the space in the last 70 minutes where, um, you know, most of you felt comfortable enough to be really vulnerable and um, share wonderful insights. And uh, yeah, myself as well. I started saying this is a selfish exercise. I heard that as, uh, it was of, of use to quite um, uh, uh, a few more people on the panel and hopefully also in the audience. Um, so I'm giving myself permission to um, say that I'm, I'm going into this weekend proud of um, having co-created the session and the space. Um, and uh, yeah, that is my closing. I am, we're already a minute over the time. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to um, also thank the wonderful Touring Way team um, for um, you know, saying this is a, a good enough topic to kick off this fireside uh, chat and give us the space. Um, so, Anne, I think I'm handing back to you um, to wrap uh, up the official part here. Thank you all so, so much for your thoughtful reflections, thoughts, tips, ideas. I, I mean, there's so much that I will take us into the weekend and beyond. Um, and I find it slightly ironic that in this space that comes from collective projects of that we created a space where we were all together to be able to talk about how we can work as individuals um, and collectively to think about care, about reframing, about um, protecting ourselves, our time and others, um, and ultimately to create better environments for the future generations of researchers, of practitioners of all kinds. So I really, really thank you all for your time. Um, I'm adding a couple of links in the chat for anyone that's interested here, some obligatory plugs, um, some mindful plugs for other community spaces where you can engage with the Turing Way and the community. Um, adding a link here to our welcome page, which has links to join our Slack workspace um, that we update with different events that we may be hosting across um, uh, different contexts and different environments alongside the fireside chats. Uh, we encourage you to keep up to date with us in whatever time and speed um, and cadence works for you. Um, but with that, I'm actually gonna turn off the recording here and unpin all of our videos and we'll leave some time for discussion and questions from the from the um, shared path. Thank you all so much.